great intro uh, to sort of give you a sense of what AI can do. And AI can do a lot of really fabulous things. Um, it can also do some scary things. And I'm here to talk about the scary stuff and give you a sense of what we're doing about, about the things that keep us awake at night. So what's really real? Just a quick, a quick uh, show of hands. Anybody heard of C2PA before? OK, good. I'm going to half of you. Good. If you have, then it'll be a bit of a repeat. But. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of time. What I want to talk about is what's the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, how do we go about trying to solve it? Um, what, what did we do? What, 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 what are content credentials? Give you a little bit of a sense of how this could fit in the newsroom. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Is this, this mic work? Yeah. A uh, couple of newsroom cases. And then if you, if you and your organizations want to get involved, how you, how you get involved. So that's, that's the story that will take us 20, 20, 25 minutes or so to run through that. Uh, so what's the problem? And, and, and I think you just saw, you know, a rock band that didn't exist just performed for us here, right? So, so this stuff's getting pretty good. And the challenge we've got is, um, in news in particular, uh, seeing is believing is just a, a given, right? Well, it, it's like gravity. You get up in the morning and you drop your shoes, they're going to go down to the floor. You sort of take that for granted. Seeing is believing is something that's a fundamental in the news business, and it doesn't work anymore. And that change underpins or, or, or starts to disrupt the entire global eco news system, which ultimately affects the global political system and can destabilize society. So just, just to sort of set the tone and, and to give you a sense of is this important or not. That's what we decided to work on. Um, you, you, you just saw a great example of this, so I won't go into too long, but people who don't exist can be created out of nothing, right? Uh, events that don't exist could be created out of nothing. And if you were malicious or if you were mischievous, the ability to create events and, and to create people can do some serious harm. But a year ago, this picture shows up. It shows up on a Twitter account, when it was still Twitter, um, that looked suspiciously like Bloomberg but was not Bloomberg. And it said there's an attack at the Pentagon. And the stock market plunged. Okay. It took about five minutes and everybody realized it's a fake and the stock market comes down. But if you knew that was going to happen and you knew the time that was going to go out and you started to short the market, you can make a lot of money. Right. Timed attacks are very, very sensitive to this kind of stuff. Um, elections are known at points in time. Right? You can start to coordinate information around elections. Uh, all of that starts to come into play. I don't know if you saw this on CBC um, about two or three weeks ago. Federal government here in Canada had a, uh, a list of, of events that are both probable and proximate. It could really happen. It could happen really soon. And these are the threats that can destabilize Canadian society. And the number one threat is people can't tell what's real anymore. Right? That's, that's a scary thing. The other ones aren't that much more fun, by the way, but, this, but we only, we've only got a limited amount of time, so we decided to focus on number one. Um, what are the threat vectors? People impersonating individuals, people impersonating events, people creating brands. If you're, if you're an advertiser, misrepresenting brands and putting up false stories about false ads, the advertising industry is really into this. All of that destabilizes reality. And then there's something called the liar's dividend. You really get your camera out and you really catch the politician doing something he really shouldn't be doing. And he goes, oh yeah, that's just AI synthesized. That wasn't really me. And everyone goes, oh yeah, yeah, that's one of those deep fakes I heard about. Right? It, it gives permission to actually, when you, reality is caught, to say that wasn't real. So, so things that aren't real can be assumed to be real. Things that are real can be claimed to be not real. It sort of puts a little bit of a wobble underneath the global news infrastructure. And then, you know, people say, well, you know, it's an AI problem. We'll build AI detectors. And, and, the, the, and I promise this is the last bad news slide I'll throw at you, and then I'll start to make, make us happy again. Uh, but detection is never going to work, ever. Uh, there's some people selling some snake oil. I hope none of them are sponsors here today. But there's, there's people saying, you know, we can build, we can build, you, uh, we can build you detectors. I was with the Partnership on AI, and we did something called the F Facebook Deep Fake Challenge about three or four years ago. Facebook put a million bucks in prize money up. They put a million dollars to create video where they knew what was real and what was synthetic, and they said, go to town, figure it out. Um, the best uh, winners could, could get 80% accuracy on the sample set that they trained on. 
If you trained them on, if you gave them, said, okay, try, I'm sorry, try, try other uh, videos and audio, uh, drop to 60%, right? 60% is just a little bit better than a coin flip in terms of trying to figure out if it's real or not. Uh, you can't put the reputation of your news division on something that's as accurate as a coin flip, right? It's got, it's got to be 99.999 kind of percent uh, accurate in order to be able to do this in an automated fashion. So one of the challenges is detection is not going to work. The other, the, other, the other problem, we talked about GANs, where you, you train a system by pointing it at a generator, at a, at a detector, and you let them work with each other. Um, what it will do is it will, the, the detector will train the generator to make a better fake. And it will train it instantly. It, it just loops around and, and it just gets better. So there's an ethical consideration about putting these things into the field. If they work, they, they actually make the problem worse. All right, so there's an ethics problem there. Uh, then there's the, the detector in the field is estimated to have a lifespan of about six weeks before it's, it's irrelevant anymore, given the pace of change and the way these, these things can train each other. And if you guys have ever done software upgrades in major networks, uh, six weeks obsolescence is not good when it takes six months to plan your, your rollout of your software upgrade, right? So, so detection's not going to work. So we got a problem. We got a thing that's going to destabilize society, and we don't know how to spot it. That's, like I said, that's the bad part. So this is where we stopped talking about AI. And then we started saying, okay, well, how are we going to work through this? Well, if we can't prove it's fake, or we can't detect that it's fake, can we certify and prove that it's real? And keep track of that from the time light starts hitting lenses and sound starts hitting microphones through to the time it's delivered to the audience. And is there a way to do that? And that's the approach we started taking. So when you look at that, the good news is the technology is there. It's hard, but it's doable. It's within the realm of, of, of technological possibilities. It's basically taking everything we've learned in banking transactions and saying, let's certify and, 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 and put security around news using banking technology, if you really want to simplify this. And we said, okay, that's good. Now all we have to do is align the entire global news ecosystem. <laughs> That'll take a while. <laughs> But that was, that was the problem we decided to work on. So you said, okay, you need a, we, need a, we need a global coalition. Everybody see this? Everybody seen this proto, right? It's very famous. This, this happened last March, and everybody saw this in panic. And everyone went, wake up, you know, this, this AI thing, it's, it's, it's here, it's real, and uh, we, we didn't see it coming. Well, five years before that, I, I used to, my, my old job, as I said, was uh, head of business strategy for technology at CBC Radio Canada. And my job was simply look at the technology coming down the pipe and say, is this good for us or bad for us? If it's good for us, how do we get more of it? If it's bad for us, how do we duck it and hide from it? And that was my job. And, and so I just wandered around and sort of studied technological trends, and I saw this five years ago. That's not real. <laughs> it, it's also not even great graphics, right? Uh, but what, what struck us when we, a couple of us started talking was the CNN logo on the screen. And we went, okay, not only can things start to be faked and events start to be faked, but we can start to be faked. And the question was, what happens when someone starts faking CBC Radio Canada hosts on CBC Radio Canada sets and have them say things that aren't real. And we went, uh-oh, that, that's, that would be bad. And that, that's really happening. You know, Céline Gallipo does not uh, uh, hawk cyber currencies in Quebec, uh, you know, or, 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 or casinos, right? Ian Hanneman Singh is not promoting growth hormones. The, the, these, are, these are things that are starting to happen where hosts and sets are being used for commercial purposes now, but the BBC has had fake footage that it's a, looks for all the world like a piece of BBC reporting with President Zelensky telling the troops to stand down, right? That's dangerous. So all of the, the imagery that gives news its credibility, and we're in the trust business, starts to say what can be used against us, and that's, that's dangerous. So I was a little worried about this. I, I started chatting with my colleagues at the BBC and the New York Times. They were worried about it. Uh, and we, we happened to run into uh, Eric Horvitz, who's the chief scientific officer of Microsoft, and he was worried about it. And the four of us said, let's, let's start doing something about it. What are, what are we going to do? 
So we said, let's, let's create something. So we called something called Project Origin. We kicked it off about five years ago and said, let's figure this out. And we were looking at video from the studio out to the audience and how are we going to protect this and how are we going to certify this. And then about the, a couple of months as, as we got into this, we ran into what Adobe was doing. And Adobe had something called the, the Content Authenticity Initiative. And they were looking at still photos from the light hitting the camera into the edit suite. And we went, okay, from the camera into the edit suite, through the distribution network and out to the audience. You know, they, that's a, they, they all connect. And we were basically saying, we're, we've got the same approach. So what if we didn't just do it for video? What if we did it for video and photos and audio and documents and PDFs and three-dimensional modeling files and basically anything that's a digital file? We could take this basic process and we can take banking things that says it's a secure transaction and we can put a tamper evidence shell around a digital file along with an identity marker that says, okay, so long as nothing has been touched, this really comes to the person it says it comes from, and it, it really is what it says it's supposed to be. And we can do that. So we said, let's, let's get some more friends together. We put the two together, we call it the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. C2PA, which is what you've heard about. We did that, we had a first spec out within a year, we've got version two out right now. Then we started bringing friends in. And we built a stack of, of, of technology components, everything from cameo manufacturers, distribution networks, publishing tools, news companies, civil society organizations. And we got multiple players at each level, so competitors. And we got them all together, and we got them into a Linux foundation. And we said, we're going to do this as a social good, and we're going to contribute the intellectual property and make it an open Linux project. And, and to, the, to everyone's pleasant surprise, everyone said, yeah, we're in. Like this, this is a big problem and we can't, gotta solve it as a group, so we're all in. So you, you know, you got everybody in there and there's, there's about 130 companies in this now. I've well since lost track of, of how many companies we have on board, but there's companies you see and know. They're like Dillette and Avid and all these companies coming on board. Then we found out it's not just news. We had the insurance industry came to us and said, this is a real problem for insurance. Medical research said it's a real problem for medical research. Um, the advertising industry, as I said, says it's a huge problem for brands. The governments have come to us. You know, the, so, so they've all said, we want to we want to be in. And we went, great. It's a, it's a standard. These are digital files. Everybody uses cameras, or you can use cameras in all sorts of industries. So we said, that's, that's all great. Project Origin stays focused on news. We said, we're going we're to do this for news. Somebody else wants to step up for the insurance industry. Somebody else wants to step up for the music industry. We'll, we'll get it up and running. But that's, that's sort of how all these pieces fit together, with C2PA being the common technical standard, and then everybody else saying, this is how the workflows work in my industry with C2PA. So when you hear about all these organizations, Project Origin uh, and C2PA, that's how they all fit together. And then we realized C2PA is a lousy marketing name. So, so one of the things that happened is Publicis, one of the largest ad agencies in the world, joined our, our group. And they went, C2PA, right? A bunch of engineers came up with this, right? And we went, yep. <laughs> and they went, OK, let the, let the marketing boys play now, right? So, they, so, so we said, the, the human-facing name is going to be content credentials. And you're going to see this starting to be talked about. But content credentials is the, is the product and service. C2PA is the organization. And there's a technical spec, there's a manifest that gets written, it's basically a header that goes on the file that's cryptographically sealed and has a, a, a data structure that works. Uh, that's all in the spec. If you want to go to the C2PA spec, it'll explain all those parts. Most people don't have to. This is going to become a product. You're just going to buy it. Or it's going to be actually a feature, but you, you, you'll, you'll find it in your products. The key concepts are this. There's, there's, a, there's a write and a read side to it, and it's going to be a function in an existing product, right? You, you go to Adobe Photoshop, it's in Photoshop now. You're gonna go into other people's tools, it's going to be in those tools that says, when I render, I'm going to write the C2PA manifest, and I'm gonna digitally sign it, and I'm gonna attach that into, the, into my output file. When I bring something in and I open a file, it's gonna say, does it have a manifest? Can I check it? Can I validate it and open it? So, so there's, there's, the, there's the signing on the output, and the reading it on the input. And that's the two sides of the process. And the manifest holds all this stuff and it's cryptographically held together. Think of it like cut and paste, open and close. It's gonna be cut and paste is on every function you use and every, pro every program you have. This is gonna be the same sort of thing. It's gonna be built in on the open and the close on the files. And then it's delivered. So the manifest is the, is the, is the package that we're sending with, with the file. And then it's delivered either in cryptographic metadata that travels with the file. Watermarking is, can give you a pointer to say this is where you could find it on the cloud if, you, if the file happened to get detached. 
And fingerprinting gives you a way to recognize it if somebody does an analog thing where they just take a picture of a picture and, 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 and moves it out. So different ways to send the information. None of them are perfect. The, 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 um, the spec talks about how they all work with each other. And, and they cover each other's strengths and weaknesses. You know? So you, you, yes, you can detach a manifest that's cryptographically attached, but a watermark could say there should be one here. right? And it can tell you where you can go find a copy of it. So you can start to put them together as, as I like to say, there's no silver bullet, but those are three bronze bullets. And three bronze bullets shot in succession will shoot you dead. right? So, so three bronze bullets is the way to go. We're getting an awful lot of support. Um, I was over at the Royal Society in London. They, they came out and endorsed us. The FTC in the United States has endorsed us. Eric Schmidt's uh, Special Competitive Product Studies came up with a big endorsement for us. So lot, lots of people are coming on the bandwagon right now. Uh, I'm really, this is one I like. Uh, IEEE Spectrum Magazine last January named us Technology of the Year for 2024. Uh, that one's going to get framed on my wall. Uh, yeah, thanks. You know, this is why I like coming to uh, uh, SMPTE events, because I do this with reporters, and I was, I was over in, in Norway last week with a bunch of uh, editors over there. They don't know what IEEE is, right? <laughs> like, I'm like, this is really big. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But th thanks, I appreciate that. Um, the White House last, last uh, October came out with an executive order. It's starting to mandate uh, an executive order on AI, and, and one of the things it's mandating is media provenance. And they, they told the Department of Commerce, Go figure out how to do this. Department of Commerce turned it over to the National Institute of Standards, who's coming up with a recommendation right now. But the recommendation, they've asked everybody in the industry, and everybody says do C2PE, C2PA. So, so you know, I'm pretty sure that you're going to start to see that coming out as a final recommendation very shortly out of the White House. Um, last February, Meta said, we're going to start doing this. We're going to start checking files on the way in. We're going to start signing files on the way out. Uh, two days later, Google joined our steering committee. And they said, OK, we're on board. We're going to help make this happen, too. And Google, you know, they, they make a lot of cameras when you start looking at the Pixel phones. So, you know, you can start to see how the ecosystem is starting to all thread together to, to do this. Um, newsroom use cases. What am I doing for time? Okay. Through, I'll, I'll quickly give you the sense of how this can be used in the newsroom. Uh, as you're seeing, the newsrooms go from the capture to the edit to distributing, and all those parts are starting to happen. Sony's starting to make cameras for this. Nikon's starting to make cameras for this. Ilica, if you want to go and spend $10,000, we'll sell you a, a C2PA camera today. Um, so the pieces are all coming together. As I said, some of the edit suites are starting to come together, and the distribution networks are coming on board. So the real work right now is to figure out the workflows for newsrooms and to figure out how does this work, because news tends to flow between organizations. Like an event happens, there's a fire, there's a plane crash somewhere, the local news organization is going to capture it, but the world is going to want it. So you got to have a file system that flows across or uh, across newsrooms, and, and we need to work those workflows out, and that's what we're working on now. So the three cases um, are sign your work, uh, validate your sources, and certify your archives. Those are the three points where you can add value using this right now. Um, signing your work is about saying, I take ownership of this. this this file really does come from CBC or Nigel Canada. This file really does come from the BBC. It really does come from the New York Times. It is cryptographically signed using their signing certificates. And if it's got that, you can trust it. And the reason we say that's important is because we think in the next couple of years, if it's not signed, you won't want to trust it at all. Right? The bias is not just seeing as believing. The bias is now signed is real. And unsigned is, is, is questionable because it could have been made by anybody. So that's sign your work. Uh, some of my former colleagues from CBC Radio Canada will, will recognize one of Jonathan's slides here. Uh, but, but CBC's gone through and found where in its output is the point to sign, because everything's going through an output control checkpoint. That's the point they're putting the signing process in. And you'll see this stuff going live relatively shortly. I think there's been a few trials. Well, I know there's been a few trials, but I won't, I won't make any announcements on behalf of CBC. But it, it, it's coming. Validating your sources, so that, that's a technical thing, by the way. That's, that's done by the engineering department figuring out where to put in, into, the, into the distribution chain the signing process. Validating your input is actually a journalistic function. Our journalists study the, the, the material it is right now. If you get some footage, they don't just put it on the air. They say, OK, that's supposed to be in Mexico. That was supposed to have happened this morning. Was it raining? The, radio, you know, the, the news report says it's raining. This, this was a sunny picture. What's going on? Which direction do the shadows go? Do the shadows might make sense for that place in this time? They do those kind of validations. And checking a manifest is there and properly signed is one more of those checks. Knowing what it means when the manifest is there, what can you, what can you take comfort in? What does it mean if it's missing? 
you know, what does it not mean? And teaching them that is a journalistic trade practice, and we'll work our way through that. Uh, again, at CBC Radio Canada, we were working with the, with the Ukrainian team from the Providence Project, and they went and took pictures of cultural institutions in the UK using a C2PA-based camera. And that's, that will stand up in the international criminal courts as evidence of what these buildings were like before, because if they're damaged, you've got before and after pictures, but they can't say, well, that didn't happen, or that happened long, long time ago. Here's a date, here's a time, here's a geocode, it's signed, and it's, it'll hold up as, a, as, as evidence. Right? So they've, they've built that kind of thing. And, and, we're, and, and we're then using that to say, okay, how do we validate this as sources? And we're, we're learning, everybody's learning about process, but the tools are starting to be there to, to, to learn how to change the craft of journalism to use um, cryptographic metadata. And then finally, certifying your archives. Um, if anyone who's a broadcaster has got a broadcast set of archives, and they're worth a lot of money. They're worth money for training, and we can talk about training databases, and they're worth money because they're a source of truth. Um, as of last summer, there was an estimated to have been 15 billion artificially generated photographs created. And this, these tools were just brought on board about a year and a half ago, so 15 billion, which is about the number of photos taken since the invention of film, right? Just to put it in things. The odds of you getting a, a, a something that's synthetic or synthetically altered, maybe it's adjusted a little bit, but, but that having that, that synthetic adjustment, if, again, point coin flip as of last summer. So you've got, you've got a real issue of making sure that you know what's true. And why is that important? Well, if you're training a database, you saw the earlier presentation that these, these, these systems cost you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to train. You wanna train them on good stuff. And one of the problems is if you train an AI system on AI generated material, you get the equivalent of mad cow syndrome, right? When cows ate cows, bad things happened. When AI systems eat AI data, bad things happen. And there's something called model collapse syndrome. The, the models start to become less effective and they become less effective very, very quickly. And you start to damage your $100,000 or $100 billion model and you can't fix it easily. You can't just undo and take that sample out. It's sort of, you know, you've put the ink into the water and <laughs> you can't then say, okay, I'd like the ink bank, please. It's sort of all mixed in there. So, you know, it, it, it becomes really important to trade on safe data. And safe data is the sort of thing that broadcasters hold. That's why you're seeing them saying, we want to buy the licenses. We want to buy AP's licenses. We want to buy, you know, the BBC's licenses. And, and, and it's, a, it's a tempting short-term thing. You know, we're going to give you money now. We're going to use this to wipe you out of business next week, but you know we're going to give you money now. What do you want to do? Uh, so, so, so that's that's what's going on right now. But, 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 sh being able to certify your archives does add more value to them. The other thing they do is they give you a version of truth, and the problem with history is it gets forgotten. Living history is really valuable, but as people, you know, we saw the D-Day ceremonies last week, you know, living history of D-Day is fading away, and the records, the historical records in the archives are what's left, and that forms a perception of what reality was at that point in time. And AI-generated material messes with that. You've got this picture, very famous picture, right? Tamman Square, very brave gentleman standing in front of the tanks, holding off the tanks. While he was there, he was taking a selfie. Okay, except the iPhone hadn't been invented. <laughs> it come, came 20 years later. But that picture went viral last spring, right? And it changed a whole lot of kids who didn't live during the time of Tiananmen Square. Their, their perception of that event changed. You mess with reality. Again, you unground and you unglue society. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. So that's what we've been up to. Uh, if any of you want to get involved, there's a couple of things you can do. It, if you're in, a, in, in a, a broadcast organization, there's three teams that have to start talking to each other. Your strategy team's got to be on board. They, they've got to say, yeah, this makes sense. Trust is a big issue for you, and trust me, trust me, uh, every, every news organization out there is dealing with, a, with a, an erosion of trust right now. So, so, so the strategy organization has to say trust is important and we want to work on building it. You need to get your technical teams involved because there's a lot of technical work to make this happen and, and, and somebody's got to know how to do that. Uh, and, and we're putting together committees and groups to introduce people that have figured it out with other people that are trying to figure it out because this is a spread the knowledge as fast as we can kind of thing because 
the house is on fire and it's time now to make sure that we're all helping each other, at least at the ground level of getting the news in ecosystem secure. Um, and then you gotta talk to your journalists. And when you talk to your journalists, they go, this is the most important thing ever, but I have no time for it. I'm on deadline, sorry. Uh, anybody talk to your journalists, right? Uh, uh, you know, so, 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 so getting them, you gotta tell them, this is no more work, right? We'll, we're, once you've figured out the workflow and you set it up and all that, on a day-to-day -day activity, on a day-to-day -day story, it doesn't add effort. It's just part of the rendering process when you start to generate your files. So you, you gotta get them on board. Um, we, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done. We've taken Origin, which I said started off with CBC Radio Canada, the BBC, New York Times, and Microsoft, and we had all sorts of other groups wanting to join us, and we went, well, we, we weren't really set up to have the world join us. Um, you know, this is a bunch of guys sitting at dinner saying, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna fix things? So we took this project and we shifted it over to something called the International Press Telecommunications Council. They set the metadata standards for news globally, and we said, we're gonna be a project there, and then all you have to do is join the IPTC and you can come and work with us. So that, that was set up a couple of weeks ago. We announced that when we were at NAB. And we said, we're gonna build an origin verified publishers list. So I told you there's all these different industries that wanna work through this, but we need to say, okay, where do you get a signing certificate for your news organization? The IPTC will give you your signing certificate. And we're working out the rules to do that and we're working it out across news organizations around the world. But we're calling it origin verified news publishers. And the reason that's important is because the C2PA standard make sure that there's technical integrity of the file, right? But if it says it's from the North Korea Department of Propaganda, and it really is from the North Korean Department of Propaganda, and it wasn't altered since it left North Korea, you have a file that contains authentic North Korean propaganda, right? That's not enough, <laughs> right? So now you need to say, okay, do I trust the source? And that's where the publisher's list is gonna come in, and, and because these are all signals we're gonna to send to the audience, right? You, you send trust signals to the audience and the audience sends trust back to you. So you take that and then you add on the brand reputation of the broadcaster or the news publisher. And the identity and the file security gives technical support to what brand always did. You know, CBC Radio Canada, Canada's national newscast, come and trust us, right? So that was what the brand statement always was, but it was just a given because you own the broadcast towers and you sent it over the rabbit ears and the TV, who else would it be, right? Uh, but when that's not sufficient, you need more technical security and support. So that's what the underlying two layers are doing. There's two parts of identity. There's the who is CBC Radio Canada and then what tools did it use? So it's, we're CBC, we took this picture with a Nikon camera. Here's the identity of the Nikon camera, here's the identity of the broadcast. You put them together, you can say, I, I believe this is technically doing the C2PA right, and I believe it was shot by CBC, Radio Canada. Right? So you start putting those two pieces together, and that all goes into the manifest. Um, the IPTC Trust Committee right now, is work, we're working on a trust list. Well, I need to update this slide. We're never gonna call it a trust list. You, you wanna have one word that will cause everything to short circuit in the news business, you use the word trust. Technically, and any engineer will tell you it's a trust list. Uh, you show that to a journalist and they go, uh-oh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, what do you mean by trust? So it's a validated publisher list is what we're going to call it, but we changed that last week and I sent these slides in two weeks ago. So, um, As I said, we're doing best practices, we're doing advocacy, we're talking this up. I'm, I'm constantly talking to journalists around the world. I can tell you, I was in Norway last week, all of the major publications in Norway are going to adopt this. I was in Germany, all the, the major German publications, Axel Springer is gonna, is gonna adopt this. Uh, the BBC is doing this. Most of the UK broadcasters are coming on board. This, this has got momentum now. So if your organization isn't yet talking to us, uh, please do, please reach out to me and we'll, we'll get you involved. There's a couple of papers we put out. There's an, an NAB paper that we wrote in 2023 uh, that's pretty good. It talks about the BBC and the CBC's implementation. It gives you a sense of how we've done it and why we did it. Um, there's the CTPA specification, which is really good if you, if you want to get into the technical details. And the partnership on AI. Has anybody heard of the partnership on AI? Is there, is that, no. Okay, partnership on AI is a think tank that was put together about six or seven years ago, completely funded by the big Silicon Valley companies. The, so OpenAI and Microsoft, Apple, um, all, all the big players, Amazon, they're all, they're all there, Google. Uh, and CBC, Radio Canada, and BBC, The New York Times, some civil society people, uh, people that worry about law. And the purpose was to say, what is AI going to do in society? How is it going to affect society? And let's get our heads around this and think about it. So we've been thinking about this in different things, people like the future of work and the future of 
law enforcement and the future of uh, economics uh, with, a, with an AI lens on them. And we've been working on that for about five years. Uh, but we put out a framework for synthetic media in and use of synthetic media last January. Uh, and again, CBC Radio Canada was one of the initial signatories. Um, it's, it's a good starting point in terms of an ethics framework on what you can and what you can't do or what you should and you shouldn't do when, when dealing with AI. Um, yeah, so these are the papers. We'll, I'm sure there's a link, there's, we'll get a link to this presentation to you, but a couple of papers if you want to see them. And uh, if you need to reach me or you want to talk to me, just LinkedIn is great. It'll, it'll, you can find me. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of you anytime to talk to you about what we're doing and get you involved. So that's, that's my talk. Thanks. <laughs>